So it has been a strange year for all of us, obviously. I entered my quarantine summer, continuing with my bird photography. Some photos are shown here, but I spent a lot more time outdoors and ran into a lot of cool stuff. Uh, some of the things are, I was walking along a field in uh, Windsor and um, looked across this field of, of wildflowers and fireweed and was, was very surprised as I think uh, he was equally surprised to see this Eastern coyote sitting there and he sat for a minute to get his portrait taken. I saw this black bear quite a few times in, uh, in Montague this summer. Uh, much more special and cool for me, although a lot of people don't like snakes, so not for everyone, I ran into this uh, copperhead. And I think there are something on the order of a couple of dozen copperheads in the entire state of Massachusetts. So to be walking along an abandoned um, road uh, and see this guy slithering across the road in front of me was pretty amazing. And um, I didn't get too close. That's what telephoto lenses are for. Um, <clears throat> with Sydney Bettner, who's uh, a guest now, I saw a couple of um, Eastern box turtles. Here's one of them. Their shells are just incredible. Uh, you can see why they were used by Native Americans for design motifs. And I also saw, but didn't photograph, this on the upper right is not my photograph, an Eastern hognose snake. It's an interesting snake, which um, if it feels threatened, the first thing it does is rise up in the air and hiss. The next thing it does is um, uh, regurgitate some very smelly stuff. And the third thing it does is roll over and play dead. So uh, it's, um, its bark is far worse than its bite. And on the lower right, uh, an Eastern rat snake this was a big one, about six feet long. It had just eaten, so I did not, uh, so it was not very quick in moving away. But I wanted to share with you today um, some, um, uh, some photos and information about the order of Lepidoptera in the class of insects. Um, and we're talking moths and butterflies. There's not nearly enough time to cover a lot of things that I should cover, but just to start, I will say that butterflies evolved from moss in a mutualistic relationship with flowering plants. So um, butterflies and moths need very specific plants to serve as their larval host because the butterfly and moth larvae can only feed on certain um, species of plant. Uh, likewise, the flowering plants need butterflies, moths, and other insects to serve as pollinators. We have to be aware that non-native plants can become invasive and cause the displacement of native plants, which in turn results in uh, crashes in insect populations. The consequences of which, and I've, we've all heard quite a lot about this, uh, for the global ecosystem are pretty dire. So I encourage everyone, if you're a gardener, plant native stuff. So I'm going to start also with a concept of mimicry. Um, <clears throat> you probably you may remember from your high school biology the concept of Batesian mimicry, and that is when a species mimic, which is harmless, mimics uh, another species which is either dangerous or harmful, to um, as as a means of protection. So here we have a butterfly, and the, I didn't take these photos because this butterfly is not is only very, very rarely seen where we are, but it's the pipe vine swallowtail. And the larvae of the pipe vine swallowtail feed on um, plants uh, like the pipe vine. Uh, the pipe, and the pipe vine, uh, it has acids in it, uh, which are passed on to the caterpillars when they eat them. And then this, these acids are in turn actually passed along to the adults and then to future eggs and future butterflies and the levels build up. And the acids are unpalatable to predators, birds and probably lizards and some, perhaps some small mammals as well. 
if they could catch them. And so what are the markings? So they've learned to avoid them. And how do they do that? Well, on the dorsal side of the pipe fine swallowtail, we see this iridescent blue. And on the underside, we see orange and white and yellow spots. So we have butterflies that mimic um, the pipe fine. One of them is the spice bush swallowtail. And if we look at it, we see on top and on the rear of the, on the dorsal side of the hind wing, we have iridescent blue. And on the underside of the hind wing, we have orange uh, and white and yellow spots. Um, the spice bush swallowtail a butterfly is a mimic, but the larvae are mimics too. And they are, oddly enough, snake mimics. So on the right, we've got a fully grown caterpillar, which, um, and it has these markings here, which are not in fact eyes, but they mimic the eyes of a snake. And um, on the left, we have an earlier instar, so-called an earlier generation of caterpillar, and it's sticking out its tongue. Well, it's not a tongue, it's an osmeterium, but it's forked like a snake's tongue. And um, so when threatened, one of these uh, caterpillars will actually rear up, flick out its, uh, evert its osmeterium um, and mimic a snake. And it also um, emits a smell, which is unpleasant to birds, although not so much to people. And another little note in terms of mimicry, the earlier uh, forms of the caterpillar are bird dropping mimics, which is actually pretty common in the world of moths. Another thing to note here on the right, you can see this is this uh, caterpillar sitting on the leaf of a sassafras. So I planted, Stacy and I planted sassafras in our backyard this spring. And the next thing we knew in the summer, we had um, two uh, species, two lepidopter species um, for which the um, sassafras is a host. One was um, the uh, spice bush swallowtail, and we also had. Um, a moth, um, which I will, uh, which we'll get to later on, so the um, uh, Prometheus moth. But um, the this white sticky stuff here is sort of a um, silk-like substance that the caterpillar gives off, and it rolls the leaf around it during the day for protection against predators, and at night it comes out to feed. So a lot of adaptations there for pr protection, which are pretty interesting and pretty cool. All right, so here's a different species of swallowtail. And by the way, all of our swallowtails in, the, in this genus, Papilio, they all, all of their um, larvae form do this snake, do snake mimicry. So here's a black swallowtail and lo and behold on the top are um, iridescent blue. And on the bottom, we've got yellow and orange spots. And this mimicry extends even to butterflies which are not in the same uh, family as swallowtails. So this is the southern subspecies of the red spotted admiral. And we look at it and sure enough, it's iridescent blue on top and has orange spots on the uh, ventral side of uh, the hind wing. Also you'll notice What's it sitting here on the right? It's actually sitting on um, some uh, animal scat that was sitting in the uh, path, in the wooded path. And what it's doing, you can see its tongue extended into that. And what it's doing is it's sucking up um, minerals. And um, so the males uh, will sit on uh, animal dung or mud puddles or even sand, wet sand, to soak up minerals, which it needs for um, reproduction. And if the nectar that it sips from flowers is not a source for this stuff, so it needs to get it somehow, and that's how they do it. So there's also a northern subspecies of the red spotted admiral called the white admiral. And interestingly enough, it doesn't, although it shares a lot of features of the red spotted admiral of, of the southern form, it has these big white bands, both on the dorsal and ventral sides. And so it looks really quite a bit um, 
less like a pipe vine swallowtail than the southern subspecies. And the reason for this is the pipe vine swallowtail range doesn't extend very far north uh, in, in New England. In fact, we're, in terms of the uh, division between the northern and the southern subspecies of the admirals, where it's pretty much right where we are, northern Massachusetts, southern Vermont. And occasionally I've seen hybrids between these two. And once again, you can see that this guy is, um, is pulling up uh, his, his minerals from the ground. And the other thing to notice here, so this, this butterfly belongs to a group um, called the Brushfoots. Uh, br it's a family uh, of um, butterflies. And if you look at it carefully and think, well, this is an insect, but really there's only two legs here and one here and one here, that's only four legs, uh, but insects have six. And brush, in, the, in the brush-footed butterflies, the four legs are actually folded up against the body. They're pretty much vestigial. And um, so they give that appearance of having four legs. And here's another swallowtail. We're all probably pretty familiar with it, the tiger swallowtail. We actually have two species here. Early in the year, we see mostly Canadian swallowtail, which is shown on the right. And uh, later on, eastern swallowtail, they also hybridize. And they look pretty similar. But um, on the left, we've got a, a tiger, an eastern tiger swallowtail nectaring on echinacea right in our front yard. And there's the giant swallowtail. Now the giant swallowtail is a little bit um, less common, although sometimes you run into whole groups of them uh, as they are emerging. But uh, once after they've emerged, they disperse pretty widely. But um, Stacy and I went up to West Haven, Vermont, which is an interesting part of the world. It was right at the mouth of the Pulteney River much easier to get to from New York over this little bridge um, over the Pulteney River as opposed to Vermont where it's a long stretch of dirt road to get there. And uh, these insects never alit, they're always fluttering so they're hard to photograph. And they are um, nectaring on um, bergamot, which is uh, a monarda. So monarda is bee bomb. Bee bomb is a, um, a cultivar of uh, Modarda fistulosa. And boy, is it popular um, for, poll for pollinators. A lot of, a lot of but moths and butterflies get their nectar from this particular plant. Uh, so now we're going to move to some moths. But these are daytime moths, not nighttime moths. And the first one, we have three species of this genus, the genus Hemeris, and this is the slender uh, clear wing. And if you look at the photo, you can see why it's called the clear wing with the shadow, with the sun shining through the clear portion of the wing onto this oak leaf. And I took this in the Montague sand plain, which is filled with wild blueberry. And um, it, the, uh, the larvae, um, uh, are blueberry obligates. That's what they, that's where they're found. And so it looks a lot like the hummingbird clear wing, clear wing which is Hemeris thysbe. This is a hummingbird mimic. And you could see why a um, moth would want to imitate a hummingbird because there are predators, birds mostly, that would eat a moth, but not so much a hummingbird. Although it, uh, Praying mantises, especially the European praying mantises, which is the one we mostly see, they will actually uh, eat catch up. They're capable of catching a hummingbird, but uh, that was an aside. So um, these, um, this butterfly can move up, down, sideways, frontwards, backwards, just like a hummingbird moves. It flaps its wings incredibly fast. These photos were taken at 1 125th of a second and I still couldn't freeze the, uh, the motion. And you can see the, the, butter, the, the moth and butterfly tongues are an amazing organ. Here it is sticking into the floret of the, uh, of the um, uh, monarda, 
of the uh, bergamot and uh, here it is sort of curled ready to be retracted. And two more images of the same species. And then we have uh, the snowberry clear wing. So on the left, we uh, up on the upper portion, we have a hummingbird clear wing and down below, we have a snowberry clear wing. And um, it's a bumblebee mimic. Again, you could see the advantage of being a bumblebee uh, mimic uh, because moths don't bite, but uh, bumblebees sting. Two more photos of that species. So it was a really spectacular little patch of Monarda there. It had, the, had these guys and it had the black swallowtails all together. So here's another group of um, butterflies. These are the hair streaks. There are, I think, around 15 species of hair streaks in New England. And I only found four this summer. One interesting thing about them is if you look at the rear portion of the hind wing, there's a little appendage which comes off the rear of the hind wing, which looks a lot like an antenna. And they, uh, they also have a dot right here, a, a marking, which looks a lot like an eye. So here we could say that this is a butterfly mimicking itself. If a bird predator tries to grab it by its head, uh, it stands a pretty good chance of grabbing the rear of the, uh, of the hair streak, allowing the uh, actual butterfly to escape, to live another day, uh, albeit with a piece of wing missing. So on the left, we have the banded hair streak, on the right, the really spectacular coral hair streak. On the left, uh, a juniper hair streak, streak, which was also found in West Haven. Here it is sitting on some Queen Anne's lace, I think. And a gray hair streak sitting on some plantain. And there you can really see the eyes and the tail of the hind wing appendages. These are all pretty tiny butterflies. Not too much bigger than your thumbnail, actually. So then we have uh, blues and azures. Um, this is an eastern tailed blue. These are also pretty small guys. Um, and they start coming out pretty early. And the eastern tailed blue shares um, the same adaptation um, for defense as the uh, hair streaks. You can see the little tail sticking out of its hind wing and the, uh, the eye dots. One of the really beautiful um, blues is the silvery blue. So these, in, these butterflies generally, when they're sitting, have their wings folded up. So all you can see is the, the ventral view, which is not that spectacular. But when it's cold, they like to open their wings and they'll, they'll spin around to maximize the solar exposure on their wings. And then you can really get a good view of the top of their wings. Here's another one. This is Karner, the Karner Blue. This is pretty interesting because uh, this uh, subspecies was discovered by the novelist, the Russian novelist Vladimir uh, Nabokov, who lived in New York. And in his, one of his travels to upstate New York uh, in Karner, which is outside of Albany, he first discovered and described this um, subspecies. It is endangered. In fact, it's really only found in isolated patches uh, around the Great Lakes and in the Albany pine bush, which is an extensive sand barren in Albany, New York. And uh, I, it, there, was an in, there has been, and I don't know the status of it, an introduction attempt into southern New Hampshire, whether that's out towards the coast or in the Keene area, I'm not sure. But they're associated with pine barrens, especially where um, lupin is found. And you can see that this um, on the left, the photo is sitting on some uh, sitting on some lupin. Angle wings. So when Stacy and I went up to West Haven, we were looking for angle wings, which we didn't find. But we did see some over in winter. And uh, angle wings are all 
wing angles. You can see that. And they're all scalloped and all kinds of different uh, angles. When their wings are folded, such as the one on the left, they are leaf mimics. And this one's also sitting on some scat in the middle of the path. And this is the gray comma, so-called because if you look on the underside of the wing right there, um, there is a white mark that looks like a comma. And here we have a question mark, which is closely related. The one on the right was taken uh, on Mount Greylock uh, in more or less early May. There were very few flowers out for it to nectar on. So under those circumstances, um, angle wings like sap. And it's probably feeding on sap from this birch tree. And on the left, you can see it with its wings folded. And um, there is a marking here, which looks a bit like a question mark. We can also see um, that this is a brush-footed butterfly, four legs, visible. All right, so some more moths. We saw some daytime nectaring moths in those hummingbird moths. But here we have some um, nighttime nectaring, nectaring moths. They are nectaring on, lo and behold, um, bergamot. And on the left, we have the master's dart moth. Dart moths are actually usually cutworms, so they're much more, um, much sexier as moths than they are as, uh, as caterpillars. And on the right, the asteroid moth, which is kind of a cool name. I think that um, moth and butterfly entomologists have a great sense of humor because there's a lot of uh, funny names for them. Uh, there's, for instance, there's a Batman moth. All right, so moving along, um, silkworm moths. So these are the, uh, sa uh, the Saturnidae. And um, this is actually the biggest family of moths in the world. Um, there are well over 2,000 species worldwide. Uh, we have quite a few, and they tend to be pretty big. Um, and also some of them are just spectacular. We tend to think of moths as being drab, but, and some of them are, but some of them are spectacularly colored. And I didn't show any um, skippers in this presentation. Skippers are very small butterflies that are much drabber than most moths. So, uh, in fact, when people see them, they tend to think they're moths. So the rule that, you know, butterflies are colored and moths are not is true sometimes, but only sometimes. So this is the EO moth. And on the left, we have one at night sitting with its forewings folded over the hind wing. And it's colorful, but not really that great. But when the forewings are um, positioned so that the hind wing is exposed. They're incredibly spectacular. Now, I did not take the, this photo on the right. I didn't actually get a good photo of an open-winged eel moth, although I saw a couple this um, summer, past summer. Uh, not all of them are all this red. They probably tend more commonly kind of more of this golden yellow color, but they have these great, incredible markings. And this is the Prometheus silkworm moth. These are pretty big. They're probably five inch, um, five inches overall, their wingspan. So I mentioned that Stacy and I put some um, sassafras in, and we found um, we found the spice bush swallowtail uh, caterpillars in it, and we also found Prometheus caterpillars in it. And we also found right on, our, right on the fence in our backyard, this Prometheus silkworm moth. So it just goes to show that when you plant uh, a native species, you know, the, the results can be almost instantaneous in terms of getting, uh, seeing uh, caterpillars that are, um, that you wouldn't see otherwise. And in general, appro improving the diversity of your yard. And this is actually my last slide. 
Um, these are two more colorful silkworm moths. Um, the one on the left is a fairly small silkworm moth um, called the rosy mabel moth. And this particular one I saw uh, in the basement. Uh, I had left the bulkhead door open and there was a light on in the basement. And I came down the next morning and there was this rosy mabel moth. And on the right, and again, this is not my photo, um, uh, a luna moth. I'm, probably most of us remember from when we were kids seeing luna moths on the screen doors of our porches. Not so much anymore. One of the big problem, one of the big threats to um, to moths in general, and especially to these guys, is uh, lights. So these big, very bright uh, sodium um, mercury vapor lights. Uh, their spectrum is very attracting to um, these moths, and they will just spend a lot of time flying around the moths, flying around the lights, and not um, finding each other to reproduce. I think, you know, the males of these species um, give off pheromones that the females can pick up miles and miles away. I mean, I think up to five miles away. But that reproductive strategy is interfered with by lights. So, that concludes the presentation. So there's plenty of time for questions. If you have them, let me get my get my uh, zoom back on here if I can figure it out. That's not it. I have to shut. I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. So there we go. Great, and there, great. And there was you know so much more I could have covered. But that is, uh, you know, for another day. Very interesting. Do we have questions? Frank? And thank you, Jeremy. That was, that was really interesting. Um, in the garden, uh, you mentioned one, one uh, caterpillar that emerged into a moth. Um, what about the, uh, the uh, tomato hornworm? Does, does that monster uh, turn into a moth or a butterfly? Yes, it does. Um, so there's two.